as land rainbow. rainbow inspiration for transformation transformation Oh yeah, and it's beginning, and this is the posture that we're going to come at it with, with a posture of open hands to both give and receive. And sometimes things will just happen by themselves, but they're more welcome and more invited if we set the stage. So we're going to set the stage so that magic can make an appearance today. And this is exactly how we're going to do that. We're going to make this a safe space where people can be authentic and chill and empathetic with each other. It's a place of synergy where we're more than the sum of our parts and we need to hear from differing perspectives. So share the mic around if you notice you've been on it for quite a bit. And it's a place of solidarity. We're on the same mission here. So let's really try to hear the perspective of the other and speak the truth in love. Disagreements, they can be helpful, they can be cool, but only if done with respect. And everyone's welcome. If you've got a PhD, you're welcome. Learning disability, you're welcome. You live in La Jolla or you're homeless, you're welcome. Atheist or Amish, you're Buddhist, you're human, you're not even human, you're welcome. And we've even had non-human participants and possibly participants from the angelic kingdom make an appearance too. So who knows if that'll happen today. And yeah, we're broadcasting this exploration to the cosmos and to thousands of people so that they can see our material. We, let's get this light out there. And so it's recorded and shared. We'll post our Zoom chat in text format afterwards on Facebook. And so if you have more thoughts that you want to add as we're talking, go ahead and put those in the chat and then continue the discussion on Facebook afterwards. This is how we're going to have our party today. What we're going to do is we're going to go counterclockwise around the room because we're a little, little out of the box here, a little countercultural. And when it's your turn, please tell us your name, something about yourself and your topic title at this point that you'd like to bring to the table for mutual discussion. This could be anything that you found interesting recently. It could be to do with existence itself, to do with psychology, spirituality, art, creativity, science, entrepreneurship. You're also welcome to share art or a book or a song that you've been listening to. If it's a song that you've made, we'd love to listen to the whole thing. And if it's something that you've discovered or a video discovered, we'll listen to about a minute of that and then share our input on it. So when we're going around in this initial section, you just mention the topic title and you'll have a chance to elaborate on that later on. Once the virtual dice has been spun and we've used this power called randomness or synchronicity to decide which of the topics we're going to go on because they're going to be put on this digital wheel. And when it lands on your turn, the time has come. You'll introduce your topic for up to five minutes and share your thoughts on it. And then we'll open up to the table for our collaborative group discussion so that something can emerge that's larger than the sum of our parts. So you ready for that? I'm ready for that. Let's go. Oh, born ready. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for pulling in on this Saturday. Uh, the faces are assembling, the minds are assembling, and that's what brings light to my heart. The moon is cool, but it's really your radiance that illuminates my life. Name's Joshua. Something about myself is that I, um, I'm trying to become more sensitive to my emotions. I kind of feel like my emotions are senses that I can put out there to discern a non-physical world, kind of like I don't know, sonar or spidey sense. And so that's something that I'm learning at the moment. And my topic that I'd like to add to our little round wheel discussion is demons. Do they exist? What is this? Like, how do we navigate this? Are there more nuanced ways to talk about these things? So that's me. And then hello there, Sir Tom. Thank you so much for pulling in, man. Good to have you here. Uh, me? Yes, indeed, you, Tom. Oh, sorry, did you say Sir Tom? that you are royalty when when i'm around you man i feel no. like i'm in the presence of royalty sorry so. sorry, sorry it's saint tom josh you need to <laughs> yeah. 
Y we, yes, only sir, because right. we Irish are not allowed to accept knighthoods for our government, apparently. You know, our government doesn't give knighthoods. The British one does, but uh, we're not allowed to accept them, seemingly. I, I don't know about Sir Bob Geldof. But there you go. I'll take over the UK government and knight the Sir Thomas and St. Thomas. But what's even funnier, of course, is that there was a Queen of England for I don't know how many years, seven, 70 years was she Queen, roughly? I don't know. And it was called a kingdom, so now they're going to call it a queendom, no doubt, to balance things out. Now that I guess that would be rational, wouldn't it? I mean, men and women are equal, right? You <laughs> got to have the balance. <laughs> Sorry, was I meant to introduce it? I mentioned a topic, I was. Indeed. Right. Uh, uh, St. Teresa of Avila, I hate to be called a saint, I think, so did uh, Francis of Assisi. Um, and I think it may be part of here. Any true saint, I hate to be called a saint. I love to be called a saint because um, I'm, 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 I'm special. If I, I would, I would think I were terribly, terribly, incredibly special if I thought I was the second coming of Christ and no one else was. But um, I think everybody is, and therefore I think I'm not special. But um, that would, that would be my topic. Are we all the second coming of Christ? And I don't mean that. I don't, Josh. Don't. I don't mean in a sexual sense, Josh. Don't look. Don't make that face. I mean, as in self-realized beings. Josh, we don't see the world as it special. is. Tom. Please mend your ways, Josh. We have a long way to go, and. We, we, we need it. We need it. We need a slightly better tone, Josh. Just, just put me on warning. That, that's my topic. Thank you. I'll tell you what. How about this tone? How about we let the music do the talking? We don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. Thank you, Tom. What a good topic, man. Are we all the second coming of Christ? It's going to be a good one. Let's go. I'll give you a heads up on the order, counterclockwise according to my screen. We'll go Ayana, and then Joey, Karina. Devon and then Bree. So uh, hello Ayana and welcome to Saturday. Thanks for being here. Oh hi. Um my name is Ayana. So something about me and something I've learned about myself recently. Um I'm a very stubborn person and I don't like listening to people sometimes, but I learned that I listen to nature. Nature teaches me lessons that I would never learn from human beings. So that's something interesting about me. Like I went to the ocean and I was having a bad day and I wasn't, I was not happy over something, but I went to the, I went to the ocean. I was looking at the the breakers and the waves and I'm like, I, and it taught me something. It's like things come and go. You can't push too much and you can't, things don't come to you all at once. You got to wait just like the waves. Cause if the moon's too close to the earth, the water would be too high, we, all, we would all be dead. But the moon's just close enough that we have those beautiful waves. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so my topic today is is related to Tom's. It's going to be about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I feel like you just gave us a gift of the Holy Spirit with that ability to wait, right? Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. If we can learn to wait with the tides, then we can yield all the treasures that Ariel is holding for us. That's awesome. Thanks, Ayana. And then Joey, ahoy, Joey. Thanks for pulling in, man. How are you doing? And do you have a topic to add to our roundtable today? Joey is the strong, silent type. You're muted, Joey. There we are. You. Yeah. Hi, Joshua. Um, yeah. Thank you. I, I'm glad to pull in today. I just had to charge. I have to work on charging my phone soon, so I keep it going. But I was uh, coming up with a topic, and the topic is telepathy and whether telepathy exists or not. As and I'm not talking about psychic things, and I would uh, differentiate being psychic and telepath telepathic as two different things. So telepathic in the sense that you can read other people's mind waves and what they're thinking and numbers and things like that as opposed to psychic maybe you can figure out what the numbers are for the lottery in the future something to do with the future event and it's not necessarily a mind to a mind but just a mind to an object and i haven't been able to figure out the lottery yet um but uh, maybe someday that'll happen My, so in terms of telepathy uh joshua and everyone else i have these telepathic um abilities which i've proven and it has to do with reading people's birth dates. And so far I've done it on children who are um, like mostly boys, sometimes girls, it's like it didn't work. The other day I did four of them exactly straight in a row uh, within about five minutes of time in a classroom with kids. And I, I told their exact birthdays, but then there were a couple of girls I couldn't do their birthday at all. Um, so far I have over 25, maybe up to 30 
correct birthdays, how many incorrect ones, I'm not sure, but it's definitely not. In terms of statistics of it, you know, you would be right one out of every 365 times, right? So the statistics of it is what I'm doing is like one out of a billion or one out of many billions of chances that the fact that it keeps on happening. So I have my own proof that telepathy works. I don't know. This just started up about a year ago for me. And, and uh, it just happens every so often. And I haven't been able to do it with adults. And just ch and every time I do mention this to the kids, they're always like, well, what's my birthday? I'm like, well, I, I can't do it all the time, just once in a while. So that, that's the topic for me today. Thank you. Jerry, that's awesome. And I was busy reading your mind as you were muted. But I really <laughs> believe in telepathy. I've had many experiences like that. I think I've actually got a little a keynote thing where we could do that together we could each pick one of the five cards and then we could see what the wheel lands on to pick that card but okay that's awesome right. joey thanks it's good to have right. you here yeah. yeah likewise Thank you. and and our canine companions too and then what's happening karina my fellow south african hey josh um hello everybody well i'm karina and well i resonate with you um ayana for me that's my happy place so whenever i'm feeling stressed that's where I go to the ocean and just watch the waves. It's cleansing and it's like God speaking to me. Anyway, just on that note. So today I want to speak about resistance. So how do you do like faith and trust? How do you trust and, and have faith that what you're doing is the right thing? And how do you stop that resistance? There's that constant resistance and that constant chattering in your head saying like, hey, this isn't right. Seriously, if we could solve that, that would be a beautiful <laughs> thing just in, in the short period of time. I love that, Karina. Resistance. Yeah, and the, the ocean, if you resist the ocean, are you going to win? There's, there's no resisting the ocean. You could just learn to flow with it. But th that's fascinating. Cool. Thanks, Karina. I'm going to be looking forward to hearing much more of that accent in just a few days' time. And so, Devon, uh, hoi, bruv. And potentially the VB crew. We're, we're, we're here. V, B, crew. We don't have a, um, a topic yet. Does anybody have a topic? We don't have a topic yet. We're, we're going to be listening uh, for a little bit. Acceptance. Yeah, we want to talk about acceptance. Yes. Let's talk about acceptance and resistance. we got a, like a full-on psychological platter is what we have here. Well, VB, crew, thanks so much for pulling in. Glad that you're here. Devin, thanks for making it happen, man. And then Brianna Roberts. Hello there, Brianna Roberts. And then Brianna Roberts. Hello there, Brianna Roberts. Sometimes you have to try twice. Hi See? everyone. I'm on. I'm on my um, computer. Can you hear me through the? Computer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Um, yeah. I'm just gonna be uh, listening today. Let's see if I can get the video on. I can't figure out the video. Um, uh, and, and I guess what's been on my mind, I, I love that you said resistance. I think that is such, um, a key thing that I'm actually walking through right now through my deliverance, um, from some of the strongholds that have been keeping me from thriving. Um, there's some resistance. There's like me wanting to go back to the way I was, but knowing that way I was, isn't going to give me the fruit that I need. Um, so there, it's a, how do you walk through painful times? Um, so that's kind of, I, I really like that topic. So it's gonna be interesting to talk about. Um, so I'm gonna piggyback off of that. Um, and one thing on my, like a saying that's going through my head this morning is, is, are we becoming, like, is the things around us making you know because there's like so much stuff surrounding our daily lives so much stimuli is that actually making us bored mm, so right. i don't know it's it's kind of toying around in my head so that's just um what i wanted to share as well the paradox it's like with so much entertainment is that actually making us bored that's fascinating yeah, so I mean, feel free to chime in with any of those topics like the acceptance and the resistance. And um, if the stimuli thing plays into it, that'll be awesome. Thanks, Brie. I know your your voice is struggling there a little bit, so you're a trooper for pulling in. Yes, um, I have laryngitis, which is not fun, but um, I'm here. I support you, Josh, and your mission. And you all, thank you so much for coming. 
Ah, look at this. You see, you just have to pick your words very carefully. The wise, they say, if you don't say anything, people will think you're wise, even if you're not. Oh, well, <laughs> so I'm super wise today. Exactly. Yeah. Right. That's what I've been saying all along. Cool. Thanks, Free. And then Chelsea. Hey, Chelsea, thanks so much for coming on in. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so I was thinking about my topic and I like always like right after the the meetings here I have something but then um and I didn't have anything but then my mom um you know she we talked about the gifts of bipolar and she um she taught me a lot because of her um bipolar and she's always always my teacher so she sent me this Eckhart Tolle um becoming a teacher of presence video today. And so I thought, well, I guess it's a sign. So um, I wanted to talk about maybe this, maybe we can listen to a few minutes of it um, and then just kind of discuss what comes up. Oh, I think it is a sign and I love it that you're accessing the gifts of bipolar. You know, I believe in that, you know, that's my whole thing, but that'd be great, Chelsea. Yeah, if you could please send the link in the chat and then we can bring it up for the wheel. That'd be fantastic. Okay. Thanks for pulling in. And then buddy, ahoy, bro. Welcome, buddy. Your topic is stoicism. Ah, oh, the man has accessed the linguistic feature. Topic is stoicism. Please text in the number to call in. For sure, I got you. Stoicism. And then we have a phone pulling in today, a Moto G7 Supra. What's happening, Moto G7, G7 Supra? Do you have a topic that you'd like to bring to our round table? And who art thou? Oh, I think the music scared Moto. It's like, oh no, that's not that song. Uh, well, I think Moto was calling in by audio and so it's hard to unmute yourself you're going to do like star six or star nine or something like that so that is epic we've got quite the selection right here of rich exploration so thank you all while i'm adding this to the wheel how about we kick off with the topic of acceptance if that's cool with you Devin and the vb crew could you talk to us about acceptance por favor good right hi my name is brian Brian Berger. I'm yeah. actually from Maryland and new to California. And acceptance is something that I'll share just like a little story about. Um, I'm, sitting, I'm 55 and I was sitting around with about five other people and they said that they had the best relationship at this age point with their mother. And I said, that's because probably because you know that she's getting older. She's set in her ways. She's not going to change. And you accept her for who she is today. And they all agreed with that. And my response was, you could have done that 30 years ago. Because that's what we need to do is accept people for who they are, not who we want them to be. And I think it's uh, truly a lot easier to go through life accepting people for who they are and then you make a decision if you want to be around them or not. And not trying to tell them how to act or just give them your points of view. Because when you think you're right, you're making them wrong and nobody wants to be wrong. Mm -hmm. So we all live in our own reality. And I just think it's really key to just accept people for who they are and not try to impose our thoughts or visions or views and make that right because nobody wants to be wrong. So I'm just leave it at that. Food for thought. Rich, nutritious food for thought. So appreciate that, man. Thanks for that. Thanks for being here and for sharing that. So let's open it up to the crew. What do you all think about that on this topic of acceptance? Do we have any hands raised? Someone here. Yeah, please, Chelsea. Oh, so um, I guess just to kind of like maybe even broaden that or kind of add to it is like, how do we accept ourselves for who we are? Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, I feel like when we, you know, try to do what we can do in terms of like, either it's easier for us to accept ourselves as we are or other people, it kind of helps 
us do both. Um, but I feel like that's something that I struggle with. I notice like a lot of my clients really struggle with that too. Like just like, cause we want to be here. Like we want to be this person with this picture in our head of like this perfect person. Or maybe we do this like perfect mother or perfect partner. And then it's like, well, how do you get from this person I am now today to this idea of like some perfection in the future? And I believe that acceptance is like really the key to that. It's like, well, first of all, you gotta love this. And then, you know, maybe eventually you get there. And, um, you know, like somebody, I guess, you know, you talked about moms and I was talking about my mom just barely and like, you know, like her mental health was really poor when I was a kid and like just very, you know, unmanaged. And I think it's really hard to accept something like that. That's like really negatively affecting you, especially as a kid where you're just like pretty powerless. Um, but but truly, you know, like being able to do that and like her being able to accept her own kind of mental health and diagnosis, like led to this kind of like incredible transformation where my therapist this week was like, wow, man, like you talk about your mom as a kid and you talk about her today. And it's like just totally different situation. And it's like, yeah, because, you know, I don't know, like she learned to love herself. I think I learned to love her for who she was. And I don't know I just said a lot of stuff, but I I think that it's also kind of taught me that same type of thing. Like this, just like really, and I think that because of her mental health, like she's so cruel sometimes, you know, especially when I was a teenager and just like this really mean internal voice that I ended up developing from that feedback that, you know, I did some EMDR and it kind of like went away for a little while. Um, but now it's kind of starting to return. And even last night, um, I was, I didn't clean the house. I was cleaned it this morning, but I had this plan yesterday to clean up and going to bed. And then this voice is just like, God, you're just, just such a piece of shit. You know, like what the hell are you, you know, like in my head of like all these negative things about what I didn't do. And so then, you know, this internal dialogue, you know, with my core self and I'm doing a lot of like IFS, which is like internal family systems with clients and with myself of like, hey, can I have a dialogue now? Like with this part that's starting to kind of come back because it wants me to be better. And um, just kind of like, hey, like we talked about this a little while ago. Like it's not super helpful when you, talk to me like that um can we kind of try to rephrase so that maybe I do feel like tomorrow I can be more productive or like get to this place that I want to be um in the future so anyway, that was a lot of stuff hopefully that fosters some dialogue too. that was a lot of richness right there Chelsea thank you thank you for that vulnerability and that openness and bringing in these powerful systems like IFS and all of that fascinating thanks what are the rest of your thoughts For me, sorry, I can't find my hand. It's normally attached to your shoulder. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> on the computer screen. <laughs> um, for me, I found, because obviously mother, just going back to mother and daughter, um, relationships are always so contentious. And as I grew up and I, I found out more about myself, I learned more about myself, I started loving myself more, I found, and by accepting myself, I also found that I accepted her because I didn't have to be right. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have to be right all the time. It was okay. And it was okay to have those so-called arguments. And it was okay for me to say, okay, you know what, you're right. Or we don't have to come to an, any agreement. We don't have to agree. We can agree to disagree. So I think it's a lot about the way we feel about ourselves and once we start accepting ourselves and things around us change somehow. And so do our relationships. Those are just my thoughts. 
I love that. That common thread between Karina and Chelsea sharing of actually this acceptance from the external world also has an internal role. If we can accept ourselves, then either we, we're more accepted by the external world or it doesn't even matter if we're not because we're just cool with who we are. And I love what you shared there, Brian, about how like, if, why waste energy on trying to be something that is going to impress everyone else when you could just completely be yourself and the people who don't like who you really are, that's fine. There's lots of other people. But if you're yourself, you'll attract the people who really like who you are and you'll surround yourself with people who really dig you. So yeah, that's that's awesome. Thanks, Karina. What about anybody else? Uh, yeah, Bree. You found your hand. That's great. Um, okay, let me see if I can put this on. Oh, she is. Okay. There I am. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I just think this um, acceptance and it's so layered behind layer behind layer. It is a, um, I say a bag of like entangled Christmas lights, you know, when you're like, oh, the season's coming, it's going to be joyous, it's going to be beautiful. And then you have to get your box out and more <laughs> likely than not, unless you're super on top of things, they come out with like very entangled, just messy lights. And so that's what like, when you're experienced trauma, it's like, you know, it's gonna be beautiful and watch one light bulb doesn't work, that would suck. <laughs> but that's sometimes how it is. And then you just gotta go like, hey, how can I replace this? This one doesn't work. Um, and just knowing the end results can be beautiful. And then I think it ties into that resistance and like getting through, it's like, um, what you were saying with those voices in your head was something that I thought was like everyone had them. It's just, or I didn't even think everybody had them, but I thought it was just so normal to have those self-hating thoughts in your head. And mine would be way, way more gnarly than that. Oh my gosh, I have thought so many things and I'm just like, think today, I'm like, wow, who was that? what was that force? And I think it ties with um, maybe Josh's topic a little bit about um, demons, you know, like I, I'm exploring this realm right now too, because um, it's like this dark force that is trying to keep us down. What is that? Because that is not of the light. And so I'm very fascinated in that topic. And I try not to explore it too much because when you put your mind to something, it's going to expand. Like, I mean, if you focus so much on the darkness, what's gonna multiply is more darkness. So um, I definitely like to have way more light and a little bit of, you know, like explore the dark realms a little bit and then go back to that because, um, yeah, I just thought your topic was very relatable and what you were saying was um, super relatable. So thanks for sharing that. Love it. Wow, yeah, what, what a great start. Let's um, conclude with Chelsea's comment and then we'll spin our wheel. Yes, please. Oh, yeah, it's a grand finale. That's right. What you got to say, Chelsea? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I was really like, there was definitely a time that I would really think that my mom's like bipolar psychosis was like a, like a demon infestation in her. And like, even just like stuff that would happen like around the house and like just all of this stuff that, you know, was like really scary. And, um, that, you know, I, I, it's just like, I, I still, and I think last week, you know, we were kind of talking about this too, like, is it inside, you know, us, the part of us, like this darkness, is it some external force? Like, and I'm still really not sure, but I do know that the solution is love. And I, you know, I definitely know that whatever she was spewing at me, was just a manifestation of how she felt about herself. And, you know, I think that that kind of just maybe full circles like this. And I had a friend that came over that just started therapy and got sober. And he was like, you know, I found out that you can't fix your own problems with your child, with your children, <laughs> you know? And I think that there's this idea that a lot of people, you know, try to like, I want you to do better than me. I want you to be a, a better person than I am. And I think, you know, maybe that's, universal and great but unless you kind of deal with the way that you talk to yourself you're going to end up pushing your kids in a way that's not positive for them or like in these like negative ways of motivating that you you might have kind of learned from who knows you know generation upon generation so anyway thanks Bri. I really appreciate what you said 
Yeah, it's powerful. It's, it's transcendent beyond us. What we don't transmute, we transmit. Fascinating. Well, thank you, VB Crew and Devin, for such a powerful topic. I think we could talk for the full two hours on this topic, but we got another a lot of other colorful and bright topics to share. I hope we can get to all of them. If not, we'll get to the ones that Synchronicity deems we should get to. So let's do a little spin, shall we? And let's see some more existential depth that's coming our direction right now. Boom. You are a winner, Ayana. Please speak to us about the <laughs> gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So I've been thinking about this for a long time. Um, as soon as I heard the term neurodiversity gifts. <laughs> It, it got me thinking about something else that um, I remember studying in my studies of the Bible which, um, about what happened at Pente Pentecost 33 CE when um, uh, the first century Christians were all, um, I'll just show you the picture. I, I, I don't have to talk about it. <laughs> I'm better at showing pictures than speaking. All right. They say a thousand so this words. Yeah. So this picture here, when all of a sudden, like I think uh -huh. a wind came in. And then this flame appeared above their heads, and then they had these gifts like speaking in tongues or be able to um, speak in different languages, uh, prophesying, um, telepathy, even like all kinds of gifts, all kinds of gifts. So when you said neuro, when you introduced me to neurodiversity gifts, like I didn't know what that was, I immediately thought of this because they had these special gifts from the Holy Spirit. So I was like, is there a correlation there? Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, see if I can do this. I don't know. Ah, maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, I don't have it here. Oh, yes, I do. Hey. Uh, this, this, I don't like Zoom because this bar gets in my way. Then I can't see anything. I know. I'm always moving my head around the bar. Okay, here we go. All right. This is in Acts. I'm going to read this real quick. Um, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, I sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house. And where they were sitting, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with, with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So I haven't looked into this too much because I would have to look more into Narvice Percy Gis, and then I would have to spend hours re reading all this stuff and seeing like where the correlation is. But do you guys think there's a correlation? Do you think these gifts that some of us have, like telepathy or just these gifts that we have are similar to the gifts of the Holy Spirit? That's what I was wondering myself. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Oh my word, I have hours, <laughs> days worth of stuff to say about that. Uh, yeah. I'll just quickly say thank mm -hmm. you and spot on. Um, so that's how I conceptualize neurodiversity gifts in all of the different modules. My point is that there's a higher dimension and the neurodiverse can be mediators between that dimension and our culture. And my very first experience of bipolar was exactly like Pentecost. That's how I describe it in my NAMI video. It felt like tongues of living flame came into me. And what happened was they were able to speak languages that everyone could understand. That was a fixing of what happened at the Tower of Babel where their languages were dispersed. And um, so everything was pulled apart so that it can be brought together back in a, a more beautiful unity. So I'll leave it at that because um, it's a very rich topic, but I love it. Thank you, Ayana. What are your guys' thoughts? Yes, it's a it's it's a pretty. I can I could talk about that for hours. There are so many scriptures about the anointed. We, I was taught they were the anointed. Oh yeah, Tom has a thought. Well, uh, yes, please, Saint Tom. Sorry, question. Um, so this is the talking stick. This is this this is meant to <laughs> maintain my sense of humor, which it doesn't. It fails abysmally to do, but it might help. It might help other people not to take me so seriously. Please. Um, I'm not sure which end it works or if either does. <laughs> um, it's a very simple question, Anna. It said um, a wind came from heaven with a small H. What do you understand by that heaven with a small H or should it be a big H? What do you mean? What do you understand the wind came from heaven? Please. 
Mm, we came from heaven. Well, I understand that Jesus did tell, I believe, Peter, that the, the Holy Spirit would come as a helper. So I would assume that Jesus was responsible for that happening from the heavens, because that's where he ascended to. Um, Mr. Tole suggests that by heavens, uh, the heavens are the skies in a lot of languages, maybe in all languages for all I know. We speak of the heavens, the skies. The sky, like God, doesn't exist because it doesn't stand out. The, the Latin to stand out from is to exist. I spent most of my life wondering if God existed or didn't, and finally God kind of revealed, honey, it's not a question of existing. I do exist and I don't exist. Um, the skies don't exist. Spaciousness or formlessness doesn't exist, but everything exists in that. So I think when Jesus referred to the kingdom of the heavens or the kingdom of the Father or the kingdom of God, he meant spacious formlessness, the unmanifested, as they call it in the East. So... Um, so whatever's up, people say to me when they meet me often, what's up? And I sometimes I'm very smart and I say whatever's up now will be done in 12 hours. But we don't know because the galaxy itself is turning and so is the cosmos. So what's up could always be up for all we know. But um, the sky which we look at is blue, but it doesn't exist. Um, you can go out and out and out and into space and, and you still you don't reach the sky. So I think Tole, as usual, is um, correct. And that Jesus didn't say the realm of formlessness or spaciousness or emptiness, as Buddhists might call it, badly translated, I think. I think he meant um, the unmanifested, the non phenomenological world, the non-physical. And when he referred to the world, he meant the physical world of phenomena and uh, physicality. And uh, that spaciousness, of course, is within every atom and, and possibly within every subatomic particle. It's within us and out and spread out around us. And um, the Sioux myth, which perhaps originated where Jesus maybe learned his Buddhism or Zen Buddhism or whatever he learned during the missing years, perhaps the Sioux myth says, um, if you know, it's, it's very lengthy. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe put it in the chat. But um, if the wind came from the heavens, if the heavens are simply the sky, and if that's a metaphor for formlessness, then um, then the key to the whole thing is right there, isn't it? That that spacious formlessness is within us and all around us, and it's within every single one of us equally. So um, so regardless of what the Holy Spirit might mean, I've said an. Whoops, sorry, I've said enough. <laughs> there goes the talking stick. Wow, that talking stick zoomed us right out there, Tom. That <laughs> that was an awesome zoomed out perspective. Thank you, man. <laughs> what are some other thoughts? Uh, yeah, Bree. Um, yeah, I really like this topic. It's another topic that I, uh, um, Josh and I talk about, we have very long lengthy conversations about, um, the Holy Spirit and it just, um, so when they were able to speak in tongues on the Pentecost, um, so, so many were like, they're just drunk and da 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 and you know, they, and then others were just like, wow, you, you know, my language, like, how do you, but you're not from where I'm from. How do you, how do you know? Um, and then later on, Paul writes, um, many of us are going to have different gifts, but there's no point of having a gift if you cannot express that and get the other person you're talking to, to receive it. If that person can't understand it, then your gift is useless in a way um so it's just um not everyone's gonna have the same gift and so it's like some christians are like oh i'm not a christian i can't speak in tongues well maybe that's just not your gift and maybe your gift is prophecy maybe your gift is you know and you really have to just connect with god and really and 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 I guess, yeah, so that just made it really, um, that's what came to my mind when you brought up the Holy Spirits and the Holy Spirit. And um, I'm busy exploring that as well. Um, I just wanted to share that. That's all. So cool. Because our different gifts force us to be in community. We're different body yep. parts. And so we need each other to be able to do this whole, to be the body of Christ. Yeah, that's awesome. And we need to be able to mediate that gift like into the world. We need to be able to get that gift out there. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and oh, I wanted to kind of relate that to mental health. And another topic Josh and I talk a lot about is um, psychosis and schizophrenia, bipolar, and how Josh really framed neurodiversity gifts very well. I just love how it's like we actually have a gift, but so there's dark forces that try to keep us from getting the goodness out and um 
and and talking about Jesus. I think that there's definitely something that's trying to keep that hush hush. And so um, I think a lot of people who are battling mental health are in the realm of fighting spiritual warfare and um, are trying to channel those gifts, but you know, you're in the spiritual realm and that is a realm that I'm still getting to know, uh, but that realm definitely exists and it's, it's not talked about anymore um, because we're just taking God out of culture, taking spirituality out of culture. Do you, maybe I, I live in a tur like a, a shell. I don't know what everyone's talking about nowadays, but I'm hearing less about spirituality existing. Um, is that the truth? Oh, I'm loving today. <laughs> There's a lot of richness. Uh, what are some other thoughts? Maybe like one or two more thoughts on this topic. Well, I'm going off the, the trail. Wheel. So forget that. Devin and the VB and true. And then we can, we can just stick to the topic. Sorry. No, it's all very relevant. I love it. Yeah. Let's just free flow. That's the way it rolls. <laughs> uh, yeah. Devin and the VB crew. I just wanted to say regards to uh, the tongues. And uh, I think it uh, signifies passion and fire, you know, tongues of fire. And, you know, like the, the Bible is so, uh, I think it's so it's such a perfect work and it's so culturally competent uh, and, and it, the cultural culture is, uh, grows uh, off of the Bible and the Bible grows off of culture. And uh, it's like what it meant then or what it means now, there's some things that are completely mysterious or there's some things that are completely true. Um, I mean, for me, I mean, I, I believe that I have the tongues uh, in, in, in lots of environments, it's kind of like a, uh, kind of not embarrassing, but it's like, it's something that I wouldn't share. Um, but in some environments, it's very, ex uh, exalting. Uh, it, 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 it uplifts me. Um, but, uh, it, whether or not I have the gifts, uh, I think it, the, the whole passion, uh, I think fire, uh, comes with like a passion. And, um, and I think all of us want that. All of us want to have passion for life and want to have a way to be able to communicate that passion. Um, and some people do it with language, with their actual physical tongues. Some people do it uh, with more, you know, like music or arts or even not, even not saying something is a way to communicate. But, uh, but definitely um, the, the fire, uh, the consuming fire of the Holy Spirit. I, I'm, I'm, I'm acquainted to, as a, it's very uh, uh, comforting that that I could talk to people in this culture, in this place about it. Also, if I wanted to uh, learn more about it, you know, what was it? What did you say? 23 of me after death? I don't know what time it was. I don't know. what Whatever year that was. Uh, I honestly 33, 33 yeah. CE. Thanks. Pentecost 33 CE. That yeah. was drilled into my head when I was growing up. Pentecost 33 CE. <laughs> Beautifully said, Devin. Yeah, wow. The power of fire. So fire illuminates, it, it lights up, it warms, and it can propel a rocket ship. And if it's out of control, it can also burn down the house. The power of fire. That's awesome. Yeah, any final comments on this thought of the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, please, Chelsea. Yeah, so um, kind of like what, um, is that Devin that was just talking? Mm -hmm. And Tom were talking about, got me thinking about like when I've had these experiences and um, things, incredible gifts are like showing up and then, um, you know, is it coming from outside or inside or are those things even real? Or are they the same thing? Like this kind of question of like, you get to like the, you know, the largest does it all end up within? And then it does kind of sometimes seem like it's coming from within. So I love this idea of that it's Holy Spirit because um, in my life, sometimes my ego likes to go, oh, Chelsea, you uh, got these great gifts. Like <laughs> You're pretty, you know, like whatever, like this, these people, you know, came to your dream or like you learn this crazy information somehow. And like, um, you know, like it's so your your person or you know, like this this body wants to kind of like take it and be like that that's you because you're just amazing. And just like 
really being able to kind of go like, wow, this is just not me at all. Like this is the Holy Spirit or whatever, you know, however you want to, I like, you know, like that, like this is the Holy Spirit that's moving through me and my ego wants to grab onto it. Like it's me, but it's not. (laughs) Spot on. And that was exactly Jesus's test in the desert when he was first filled with the Holy Spirit is, are you going to take all the glory for yourself? So I think these same things are still happening. Yeah, what a powerful topic. Cool. Thanks for that, Ayana. And I think there's fantastic ground to be explored there and that we did explore. And let's continue the exploration and let's bring the round spherical mass of a planet into color and spin our wheel here. Hey. Buddy, it is you and stoicism, man. Are you able to connect to audio? How's your audio there? Calling all buddies. All buddies? Okay, well, I, can I unmute you? I can ask you to ask unmute. You to unmute. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Is that good? Yes. Can you hear me? Maybe an echo if we talk back. Let's see. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, what do you have to say about stoicism? Okay. All right. Great. Um, here. Stoicism is quite fascinating. If, it, if it's anyone ever heard number one of stoicism, anybody in the Zoom call here to heard of stoicism? What do you think it is, Josh? Take a stab at it. Uh, it's a philosophical position held by the Greeks that they, it's kind of like a detachment from circumstances where you're not shaken by everything around you. In a way, it's got a reputation of being like stiff lipped and you just kind of deal with things um, and you, you don't let it get to you. But there's a lot of profundity. It's an existential approach to reality. Yes, yes, I would concur. And you're definitely on course and they're on, on the right course. I just did an audio book on it. Um, it originated around 300 BC and it was monumental. It was in terms of philosophy, it was monumental. It, it's a tool. Stoicism is like a tool of what? A coping method, mechanism. Is it not, Josh? A coping mechanism for what? Adversity. Adversity. Any type of adversity that life throws at you. Life doesn't go your way. There's adversity, um, disaster. Oh, oh and, and I can break it down into two things, two main concepts, things we can control people and things we cannot control. We have control over our, oh, it says my interconnect connection is unstable. Did I lose somebody? Did I lose I it? You. All right. Yeah, you're all good. The How things you got to break it down into things you can control and the things you Okay, good. We can control things that are platonic, things like we could control what we're going to have for lunch, for dinner. We can control if we're going to go to work or not, right? We can control who we have a relationship with or not. We can't control somebody's death. We can't control cancer, or at least right now we can't control cancer. We can't control death. We we, we have no, the things that, that God's under control with, we can't control with. We can try to deal with them, but we can't control. And, uh, in, in, in essence, if I want to boil it down to a nutshell, you can't. We can't get bogged down with the past or things that have not gone our way, and we have to sort of cope. Just like you said, Josh, be stiff-lipped and kind of deal with it. We have to kind of deal with it, deal with the set of circumstances with what which we are given. Now, you know, now Brianna might agree, disagree with this because theology doesn't depend on circumstance. Theology, our, our theology doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily predicated on our set of circumstances. It's predicated on our faith. Um, I wanted to add that Zeno was the founder of Stoicism uh, as opposed to Epicureanism, which I'll get into later here. Um, break it down into three components, logic, physic, and ethic. And those are three main tenets of it. Um, it uh, you have leaders that use Stoic principles to deal with major crises and major adversity, right? And, and, and that goes throughout the centuries, you know. It, it's worth looking at, worth taking a look at in, in terms of dealing with 
whatever adversity you, that's been thrown at you, whatever cards you're dealt with. Uh, uh, stoicism is a good way, and, and learning stoic methods is a good way of coping with them. And I'm going to leave it that, and I'm going to leave it to the uh, to um, people to discuss an open forum. I love that, buddy. Uh, some of my friends are obsessed with stoicism, and I'm hearing a lot about it lately. So I think it's a great topic. Thanks for what you shared in that research and stuff. What are you guys' thoughts? Anybody got any thoughts, Tom? You got any thoughts on it? Have you heard about it? Kelsey, Ayana, and then we'll come to Tom with his talking stick. <laughs> yes, Liz. Um, I think that this idea of like these circumstances that we're born into, and like you know, that that we have to accept, you know, that, and that that's part of our learning process, right? That's what we're supposed we we agree to deal with this stuff and and we have to walk that path. Yeah, it's the things that we can change and the things we can't change. The serenity prayer, the courage to change the things we can, serenity to accept the things we can't and the wisdom to know the difference. Ayana. So I think a stoicism, um, does it require you to not process your emotions? Or is, am I am I interpreting incorrectly? Well, I, I, I agree. I think you got a point, Ariana. It wouldn't be healthy to suppress our emotions in a way. And I think any therapist, and I've had therapy myself, would tell me that it's you can't suppress your emotions. If you need to cry over something, just cry. If you need to laugh, just laugh over whatever over what you're feeling. Um. I think it's a me method not suppressing as much as a coping mechanism is what I get out of the, the topic itself. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because the only thing I would think would be because that's kind of been my approach with a lot of things in my life is I tend to suppress the way I feel until it becomes too much. And that's when it comes bad. So I'm like, that isn't good either. So I was wondering, because I know I, that's my personal struggle with my version of stoicism, which isn't very healthy at times. Yeah, that, that sounds familiar to me too. I also associated stoicism with kind of like not uh, going with the emotions, which is interesting. Um, so Tom, you didn't actually have your hand raised. So let's go with Devin who does. And if you would like to contribute, we don't want to put you on the spot. So let's go with Devin and the VB crew. And then it's up to you if you want to share, Tom. And then Karina. So, hi. Um, I'm Alice. Um, hey, Alice. And my understanding, I, I'm, I'm not stoic myself. My understanding of stoicism is is like a person who has, you know, has like morals and is grounded and has um and, and has like a love for their for their bloodline. Because um, so if I'm if I'm not mistaken, the stoics don't don't believe in a high power like God or Jesus or the Trinity or anything like that. They believe that 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 their good works are going to to develop in their bloodline, in their family. If, if I if, if I'm if I'm understanding this right, I'm kind of sorry. Um but the, the thing I wanted to mention was that and uh, you know as, as Catholics we have a higher power and we have we have heaven, like a place that where we that we are trying to get to. But as Stoics, we just do the right thing because it's the right thing and it's morally correct, if I'm not mistaken. That's yeah, that's such an awesome and fascinating point, Alice. So, like, is there a belief in a higher power or does it matter? Is it just about doing the next right thing? We have a comment from Buddy in the chat who spoke to that and he said. Let's see here. And he said, nihilism crosses over with agnosticism in a sense. So if you don't believe that there's any purpose, then you can't really know if there is a higher power. I was answered. Sorry, I was answering Bree's question. I was. She had a question about it. She said, what's nihilism? And I said, I covered it a few months ago. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not directly on point with the question. I didn't mean to be off, off point here. So what do you think, buddy? Do you think that um, stoicism 
necessarily implies that there's no higher power or guiding force? I wouldn't say that. I don't think they're getting it's that stoic, predominant stoic philosophy got into that uh, a discourse over does God exist or not. I think it was more of dealing with what life throws at you, dealing with what uh, happens to you on a day to day basis. Now, there, there is a crossover where Christianity has been mentioned by Stoic philosophers and people that have reflected on Stoic philosophy. Uh, it's mentioned, but they don't go in a whole lot of depth over um, theology. There is some, there is a discourse on the theology, but it's, it's not very, very extensive, at least from my, from what I've read on it. Cool, and maybe I'm just the wrong person. I just read, I had one audio book on Stoicism, and that was it, and I'm sure it's, and there are volumes and volumes and volumes on it. Um, from what I, what I gather, it's just a matter of cope. Can you cope with what's given you? Sometimes things are going to go your way, sometimes they're not. You've got to deal with adversity. Absolutely, and then just anecdotally, the few friends who are really obsessed with it, they are agnostics. So I don't know if there's some sort of correlation or if that's just an isolated thing. Yeah, Karina. Okay, so my thoughts on um, stoicism, it's like the obstacle's the way, right? So if the obstacle's there, we have to find a way around it or learn from it, my thoughts. Um, and then depending how you deal with it, then you can deal with the next step. So isn't it about just doing the right thing at this moment and just moving forward with that? Just doing the right thing. and that's always such a subjective thing anyway, because obviously a lot of times what's right for me doesn't have to be right for someone else. And we can go into a whole philosophical thing about right and wrong in a spiritual sense, but now I'm talking practically. So, so you, you just go through that. And I'm going to put my version of it because obviously the obstacles, the way is there, but surely it would be the way you see it. So if you find the blessing within that obstacle, then it'll change it and you can deal with it better in a different way afterwards. I'm not sure if I answered the question, but that's just what I thought. Oh, I think it's a, it's a good one. The obstacle is the way and we can actually add meaning and purpose to the obstacle in our path if we learn how to learn from it. Tom, did you have something that you wanted to share? No pressure. I, I, I would love to please. Um, thank you. Um, a lot of... Hollywood movies like The Patriot and um, The Gladiator are the hero's journey. Joseph Campbell, it's really Socrates' story as relayed by Plato in the Republic, the hero's journey. Serpico, oh, so many of them. But what makes Gladiator outstanding, I think, is uh, it's loosely based on Marcus Aurelius, the ultimate quintessential stoic come down to us in the West, I think, and his quotes are magnificent. But one of them sums it all up. I think he says, to act as though you had already died. St. Francis of Assisi spoke of the second death. Uh, when you've died, according to Christian belief, then you step into eternity, as though we talk about being on the other side of eternity. It's an absolutely absurd concept that that we we are not immortal beings, but that our eternity starts when we die. It's 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 it's, it's, it's so nonsensical, and yet we fall for it. Um, if we realize that we're right in the middle of eternity, always timeless spirits, as as how could we not be? Then um, then time is no impediment, and all obstacles disappear. And the obstacles are always the way. And uh, every single quote on Goodreads, I think, from Marcus Aurelius uh, is another way of saying that. And they measure up beautifully with quotes from um, Meister Eckhart. Uh, All God wants from man is a peaceful heart. We must every day be mothers to God. Between God and me, there is no between. Um, so the, I have a book at the moment, I've been really interesting one about the, better than the art of war. It's about um, martial arts, the samurai. But they acknowledge that the Zen masters were way beyond those martial artists that what they were really pursuing through martial arts art, martial arts was zen but they realized that the monks had reached that the ones who did practice zen whereas the martial arts were just a, a more superficial exercise i think marcus aurelius grasped that too that it's beyond fighting beyond resistance beyond war beyond discipline that at any moment we can step into zen which is what jesus said at any single moment we can put first the kingdom and putting first the kingdom isn't necessarily being above the trees. It's trying to seek the higher consciousness. It's trying to actually remember our sense of humor, which is the highest. Um, so so I think Marx really has grasped that, and he puts it into hundreds of beautiful quotes, which you can find in Goodreads. 
um, uh, in The Gladiator, he says early in the movie, I think he says, if you can feel the sun in your face and the wind in your hair, saying, as you gallop through the forest, you're already galloping through the Elysian fields, something like that. You're already in paradise. The Greeks and the Romans, the, the warriors and their women, uh, lived with such intensity because they realized that they're living through uh, eternity. Uh, later in the movie, he says something like, all we do in life echoes in eternity, because we're right in eternity. When we forgive our mother for being such a B-I-T-C-H and our father for being such an idiot, and their parents and their parents before them, that rippling goes equally backwards in eternity as well as forwards in eternity, because backwards and forwards don't have much meaning. So um, so I think it's all there, um, and I think um, it's incredibly wonderful that you introduced that topic, buddy. Um, that the the Stoics basically said, embrace Zen, no matter what the obstacle, no matter what the the um, the circumstances, that that all the resistance ultimately is within you. Um, so so like Francis of Assisi again, uh, the serenity at any moment we can accept the serenity by by accepting our our outward surroundings and realizing that um, by offering no resistance at any moment we step right back into Zen, the kingdom at any moment. Thanks, uh, buddy and uh, Karina and everyone for that. Man, you're on fire, just, Tom. Yeah, last comment by a buddy. Yes, I wanted to, and very, very, you, you're right on point, and I'm so glad you added that was a very, very meaningful uh, addition to my topic here. And the philosopher I was thinking of was Marcus Aurelius, and I could not put my finger on his name or actually picture his name. Marcus Aurelius was very instrumental as far as stoicism goes. Yes, no question about it. And uh, to my last point, uh, stoicism is about a lot of times one of the prevailing themes is we are worst enemy in, in some sense and you've heard of saying no there's nothing to fear but fear itself very true with the stoics a lot of times we're so obsessed with what might go wrong that we're not living we can't live because we're so fearful about what might go wrong as opposed to it, nothing's going to go wrong unless you think it's going to go wrong. It crosses right over to you. you ha, it, it's you bring about, you know, the sea. It crosses over to the secret. I am because I think I am. I am. What happens is what I think is going to happen in a sense. I'm not saying it fully crosses over with Rhonda Burns secret, but there are some at, attributes that do cross over to it. Fascinating. And that reality manifests itself within community because you forgot Marcus Aurelius's name and then it comes through Tom. And so we can fill in each other's blind spots there. But that's awesome, buddy. Thanks for that rich topic and very in line with existentialism, how we can handle these things that roll our way. Well, speaking of rolling, let's roll this thing. Boom. Yes, please, Karina, on resistance. Um, <laughs> um, it had to come about because Tom was speaking exactly about resistance. So, you know, there's no, there's no coincidence. And, and that's exactly the way I'm, I feel about this too, is the resistance is always within ourselves. So the resistance always in my head. Um, the stories I tell myself, the, the, the things I think that might happen. But with that comes the fear and the stuckness and, the, and, the, the, and again, back to the resistance to move forward and do what I need to do. That's my take. That's not much, but that's just, you know, it's, it's all in my head. It's all, it's all the crazy stories I tell myself and the what ifs which sometimes don't even, they, they never exist, never do, because when I do actually step out and do what I have to do, it's beautiful, and, and think that life just opens up as it does, but I created this craziness within my head, and I created the resistance, and I, and I stop, and I stop myself on every level, and then, of course, then the procrastination also comes in, and the self-flagellation, and that's the worst part, the beating up, it's that that um, the whip is always so big, but I've learned as well over time to to throw away the whip, and I've learned also that the self love, the self love, and the self acceptance um, works a lot. So it's easier to 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 re resist the resistance. 
for the want of a better word. That's it. Beautiful, Karina. That's it. Yeah. So, Tom, if that was your whip, your talking stick as a whip, throw that thing away, man. We don't need that. And it, I love what you say there, Karina, because Mark Twain said, I've had thousands of problems in my life, none of which never happened. Ever happened. <laughs> it's just these things that we have in our head and they drain so much of our energy. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, we've got Ayana. I really like uh, your message, Karina, because that's something I, I constantly have to deal with is resistance of things that could be because basically if sometimes when I get on a negative thought or worry and I don't even think about it, I just, it repeats, it goes bam, bam, again, again, again. But that's what brings on that anxiety, which turns into the bad situation. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So um, I'm trying to work on my anxiety with certain things like I'm doing some exposure therapy, putting myself in situations that typically make me anxious so I can really train my brain not to go into that negative feed loop when I'm, when I'm, uh, think I'm in a compromised position. So it's, it is a, I know work in progress. We all are, but thank you. <laughs> See, you're resisting the resistance there. Yeah, that takes real courage, Ayana, to resist the thing that's resisting you and step into exposure therapy. That's awesome. What are some other thoughts? Yeah, Chelsea. Um, yeah, I just love how it always just seems to like, so it's like, we're just digging this really rich soil, but, um, yeah, as Tom was talking, um, and buddy after, um, I started thinking about this idea that we do a lot of shoulds, you know, like I should have cleaned my house yesterday or this shouldn't be happening. And, you know, this idea that should, um, just really creates so much suffering for us. And like, it does go back into this idea of whatever so stoicism is what I kind of got from it was like that we're just accepting what's happening so um anytime that we're like resisting that and putting ourselves in this idea of like this shouldn't be and this shouldn't be happening we're just like really magnifying like all of the negative things that are you know like you know whatever it is like we're just really magnifying our suffering um yeah, absolutely. I mean, they say in lucid dreams, so lucid dreams are when you wake up within a dream. Initially, you can fly, you can meet all your gratifications, but they say the best thing you can do is to not change anything. Just accept it all as it comes, because that's the most profound message from whatever your unconscious, the collective unconscious. What if it's the same in waking life? It's like, where did we come up with this idea about how things should be? Is it Hollywood? Like, where do we even get this? If we just accept the intelligence that there's intelligence behind how things are, we can flow with it and direct our energy towards more productive channels. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, Chelsea. What about anybody else? And Chelsea, yes, please. Well, it just got me thinking because um, I had this client that was having nightmares. And so I brought up lucid dreaming. And then I have this dream that I like gave birth to like this plastic mannequin. And then like right in the middle of the dream, I like was just like, oh, well, it's okay because I'm just I'm just dreaming. And it just got me thinking about, um, you know, what if we could just do that a little bit more in life? like that <laughs> whoa um yeah that that's cool that's really cool it's literally the topic i was exploring with our virtual clients yesterday <laughs> that's awesome bringing lucid dreaming into waking life but yeah I, I dig our field what about anybody else on this topic of resistance Can you can, yeah, yes, sir. Can you yeah, contextualize? Ready. Can you throw this into context when you say resistance? Can, we need to narrow the scope, please. Narrow the scope of the topic. What do you What do you mean by resistance, Green? Have you got any uh, example about what we can resist or how we can not resist? Okay, let me say um, simple thing. Like I have to write a book. Okay. And I know I've got to write that book. I've got a deadline to write the book, yet I resist to write the book because of, well, you know what? I, I actually don't know how to write the book. or It's all my stories. You might, or you, maybe I have to do, so it could be also part of like procrastination. Maybe I have to do something else instead of writing the book. Or, oh, you know what? I'm really hungry. I have to do the, the book. Okay, so it, it's, it deals a lot with procrastination as well. But on, and, and on the other hand, I'll, so I'll resist writing that book. 
until the very last minute, then it's like, okay, now I have to write the book. And then I still resisted and resisted and, and hate myself for it. Because uh, of course I'm hating myself for it because I'm resisting and I'm and I'm feeling bad and and my, my intuition is screaming at me so my emotions are all over the place, and it's a it's a terrible place to be. So I don't know if that helps. It's a very simplistic kind of um, example. So right, Corinna, you're getting into procrastination issues a little bit. You're, you're talking uh, about procrastination. Are you, is that where where you're going with this? So it, 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 it boil, it's all like together, right? So you resist doing what you have to do. So then the procrastination comes in because I'm resisting. I'm resisting doing that, that thing. Mm -hmm. I'm resisting. It. And, and instead of, or it's, it could be even if I have to speak, say you have to call somebody and you're resisting calling that person because of what you're telling yourself of how they'll react or what will happen or what will happen once you have the conversation or will it destroy the relationship and you have all these stories in your head so you don't make the call so that's resistance so what i'm also saying is that if, if you can get to a point where i can trust and have trust and faith and know that um, i don't have to listen to the voices in my head i can just connect to to god or or divine or whoever and know the right thing to do and not have that resistance okay i think you're getting into yeah, mental blocks psychological blocks in our own inner psyche i think is where you're going uh to some extent karina a lot of times you know we, we it's a mental things are a mental block and somehow we have to just let go of the block and do what we got to do is i'm thinking where you're going Yes, that is on, on some level, it's that. And like I said, and a lot of times it's just the stories I tell myself. Like, like I said, like making that call to a friend or whatever. Um, you resist that until you can't, you have to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Good, good point. Yeah, I think in my life, like the hardest, most stressed out I ever am is not when I'm actually doing the thing that I was worried about. Like, it's actually so chill, but it's like the days and the weeks and the hours leading up to it. And why? Like, why did I burn myself out like that? Then you activate your fight or flight response. Then you're actually more likely to perform badly at it. If you just kind of chilled out of it, things would go better. Yeah, I feel you, Karina. Thank you. Final comment on this point of resistance. Yes, Chelsea. Um, yeah, so... I had this friend that I talked to one day about this some, somewhat. And she said, you know, you're just gestating this right now. And she was like, you're giving birth to this big thing. And, um, you know, nobody would ever say to a woman that's pregnant, like, why don't you just hurry up and have that baby? <laughs> you know, like, and I think that so much of this and like, also like the concept of like everything gets accomplished in nature, but nothing's ever rushed. And and I think there's this sense of like culture does this to us a lot or this internal should, oh, I should be working on this and not understanding that, that maybe there's a process that's happening underneath the surface that is accomplishing the goal. And I'm working on my dissertation right now. So it's like very speaking to me and like so many different levels, but like, it's, you know, what we're, what we think we should be doing, what we're doing underneath the surface in terms of subconscious, in terms of like the timing. And then this idea that like, we don't allow ourselves to have these cycles of uptime and downtime and resting and, and working and, and reaping and sowing. And like, we're just like supposed to just, you know, do, do all these things. And I don't know, I'm trying to kind of shift this idea of like that something has to be done you know, exactly when I think I'm supposed to do it, because like, maybe I just didn't like, this wasn't the right time to do it. And I had to like, go through all these iterations of thinking about it and thinking about doing it in order for it to be really ready to be born or ready to be created. And that that's part of the process. That's beautiful right there. I hope you put that in your dissertation. We need more of that in the world. I can't wait to kind of get out of this fast, fast, fast California pace and into South Africa where it's a little bit more like that. But we can bring that to California. I mean, that's just me doing it to myself. Uh, but you're so right, Chelsea. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for the topic, Karina. I think it's, it's something that we all deal with. And I think there's been a lot of wisdom shared on it here. So let us uh, let the natural cycles take their cycle and we'll spin our wheel and see what it naturally lands on. Well, we got three of us. Yeah! 
that's you, Chelsea, with Eckhart Tolle and teaching of presence. So we got a little video. Is there a particular spot in the video you'd like me to start? Would you like to preface it with something or what do you think? Yeah, I mean, let's just maybe watch like the first one or two minutes. It kind of just is a little bit repetitive. And I think that's enough to um, hopefully, you know, dialogue a little bit and um, yeah. Beautiful, is this the one right here? So yeah. Let's go. Thanks for bringing this to the table. Tom's heart is skipping a beat because it's a console. Yeah. Bro. And then we go on to uh, people who are already uh, working in a helping capacity with other human beings. Let's say you're. you're uh, um, psychotherapist, counselor, social worker, body worker, nurse, doctor, and so on. All these in these professions, uh, you will in many of them you have a certain way of interacting. There's a certain structure that you use. Um, that is helpful when you work with people, even if you are certainly a doctor has a very certain struct structure of all his knowledge. He, she applies all this knowledge to a nurse also is highly trained, a certain structure, you have to do this, this and this. A psycho psychotherapist may probably has been trained in a, in a certain school of psychotherapy and he, she applies whatever technique they have learned as part of their training and in the applies that uh, um, hoping that it will be helpful and if it is necessary and and helpful but as presence arises in your life you may find that or you will find that uh, an additional dimension comes into the way in which you practice your profession with other people a different dimension an additional dimension comes in and that is the dimension of presence then you become you're not only let's say you're not only a nurse you're also a teacher of presence as you go about your profession you're not only a psychoanalyst say you're also a teacher of presence. So how, what is that shift? The, the, just as an example, you may be, let's say you are a psychoanalyst or psychotherapist. Psychoanalyst, strictly speaking, is a Freudian therapist, but yes. Um, Eckhart, man, thank you for that. Should we pause it there, Chelsea? Was there anything else that was coming up that you'd like us to hear? Yeah, yeah, I think that's really good. It was a question at the end, um, right before you stopped it. So perfect timing, I think, to just like, how do we cultivate this in our lives? Like, you know, he talked about some specific professions, but I think, you know, it's more just even how we're existing among family. I think that we're all kind of like having the, the maybe being called in some instances to kind of be this presence and, um how are you doing it in your work? Um, anybody that's kind of aware of this, how how might we do it? And then you know, just kind of like pulling back from because I knew I was going to be up next because we were just talking about this idea of doing and then allowing, right? That we had to learn this, like we had to take this active step to like cultivate this wisdom, this knowledge from the books, and then suddenly we just have to then like just be it and embody it and then allow it to come forward. And one of the scariest things for me as a therapist is when a client says to me, I'll never forget when you said X <laughs> because I'm like, what the hell did I say? Um, you know, I don't know that I remember a lot of the things that they really take to heart. Um, one client called it uh, Chelsea's troop serum um, that there's these moments, there's these times maybe that we've all experienced that you're just like, I don't know why I said that it's scary. Um, and then this idea that kind of goes back to what Brie talks about 
<laughs> which is like, is that coming from God? Is it coming from some other darker force? And I am going to put in the chat, um, like a cleansing kind of like a uh, shield that, you know, I've been using, um, that maybe everybody will find helpful. So a lot of things, but what do you think? <laughs> Thank you, Chelsea. I love that. Yes, please, Ayana. So um, I'm not a professional in anything, but uh, I do work as a peer educator at my college. And I think out of everything I've ever taught, like I've taught a lot of good things. Like I just did a stress management skill shop and there's some like great exercises people can do like mindful self-compassion doing deep breathing body scans you know so I teach students how to do that but one of the most powerful things you can teach is your own story and your own truth and what you've learned from your own life and that is priceless so that's what I thought of when you talked about you know being that presence it's like we you have to speak your own truth I think um, I think Eckhart Tolle, I read his book and he even talked about it. We don't want to identify too much with our roles because that's just the, like a mask. Who are we behind that mask? Because I remember reading his book and he was talking about that. Like, we don't want to put that egoic title on ourselves and make that who we are. Absolutely. Block off that light of presence. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I... I love this whole, how he said that there's a different dimension that we can access. That's, I mean, after this, I'm presenting at a conference, we're talking about that, that there's a different dimension here. And so I think sometimes we fall into those masks, like you're talking about, Ayana, and we're just playing the role, especially within therapeutic relationships. We're doing our training. I think it's like a scaffolding. We have to be able to climb it or put some things in place, and then we can build our own flow around it. So I think it's good to have the training. Um, sometimes we can get stuck in the training though. And I think that the, it's supposed to lift us to new levels of presence. And so then we can actually facilitate something that's emerging between the two of us. I don't think it's like us necessarily trying to fix them. I think actually we're both learning from this liminal space that's between us and something larger will emerge. It's kind of how you're describing how these gatherings tend to work. Chelsea, there's something orchestrating it, some flow of the topics and um, that is fascinating. Um, I love that. And actually at this conference, I, I know a lot of the speakers are talking about that kind of a thing. I'm also reading a book about how in psychology at the forefront of it is that understanding of this dynamic co-creation that happens within therapeutic relationships. So I think that's an awesome thing to include in your dissertation too. I dig it that you're exploring this. Yeah, Karina. Um, sorry about the noise. I um, I relate exactly to that because uh, I feel that within my my coaching sessions as well, where you have you, you have your client, and then you have another force that just comes in while you're working. So there is presence because you're totally present with that person. You have to be right. Well, you don't have to be, but and you've got that energy. And a lot of times, um, I understand. I, I can relate when Chelsea you said. He, the client comes back and says, oh, I remember you said this and I remember you said that. And a lot of times I don't remember. So it's almost like I become a different person within that, that, um, that environment or that energy or that, that space almost. So, and, you and it's the, that total presence. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's beautiful. Is. Yeah, it is kind of, kind of scary. I mean, so we're turning neurodiversity gifts into a package set, like a train the trainer. And they're saying, we don't want you to script it. We want you to just be in the flow. That's where it's going to come. And it's like, oh, geez, well, then what am I going to say? Like, <laughs> what's going to come through me? Do I want to do that? I mean, having the script there is kind of from my logical left brain. I've thought through every aspect of how this is going to be perceived. If I let all of that go and let my right brain just flow in the moment, what's going to come through? And is it going to ruffle feathers? I don't know. So it's a decision I have to make within myself. What are some, what are some other thoughts there? Um, Please. I was I was thinking about the exact same thing, um, like you know, for the pod, if a podcast, for example, if you have it scripted, you don't you don't have you have that jarring of the conversation. Whereas if you're just speaking to it, um, like we do here, then it comes through everything that's natural that's supposed to come through comes through, and uh, you have to trust that. 
you have to trust that and know. And for me, that's an, a, a better place to be rather than having it scripted and having to think about the questions that I've got to ask. So and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it there, Karina. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just roll with the phone call. Thanks. So if, if I say anything from the unconscious, then I'll just say, well, Karina said. No, I'm joking. No, that, that, I think you're so right. <laughs> I think we're tapping into something larger. Appreciate that. It's encouraging, though, because I've, I've seen that. Anybody else? Yeah, Chelsea. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know that I popped um, my dissertation chair, wrote a dissertation on um, basically this idea of non-dual awareness in psychotherapy and really like great um, research about how to do this and, you know, what these many therapists kind of um, talk about as ways to connect and ways to be present. And I think that, you know, personally, it is like this awareness of, you know, like, um, Ariana, is that right? Alon Ayana. Ariana, um, Ayana, sorry. Um, Ayana said like, you have to be aware of yourself in your, you know, relationship to what's been being spoken about, like that embodied presence that you have that feels like you. And, and then be in relationship to that in a way that like other things can come in because like, I think you are so right. Like your personal experience as a person is super important, but it can really also get in the way of that presence and allowing that to come in. Yeah, that dichotomy. And for those watching online afterwards, if you would like that downloaded file, just send Aslan's rainbow an inbox message and I'm happy to share that with you. Thanks for that, Chelsea. Do we have any final thoughts on this topic of teaching of presence? I would say, uh, I'll give a final thought. I think that as a species, we've kind of moved from, I don't know, like a collectivistic understanding through the industrial revolution where everything was chopped up, systematized, stuck into machines. Now we're in postmodernism. I think that we're rediscovering that there's something larger that we had in the collective era and lost in the industrial age. I actually think this is what we're becoming as a species. And I think this kind of a space within the therapeutic space, particularly in California, there's something beautiful emerging that's going to come up through the collective later on. And so it's really, really an honor to explore these topics with you guys who put this into practice in your daily life and to map out some of the contours so that we can help put up that scaffolding for others so that something larger can transcend them. So thanks for that, Chelsea. And it's always good to hear Eckhart Tolle and I'm sure Tom's stoked about that. Well, Tom, I think we just come to you, if that's cool with you. Can we do your topic? Are we all the second coming of Christ? What do you think? I, I kind of never talk about anything else, Josh, so I, I defer to you. you. You go on about demons first, please. Don't be so gentlemanly. You're always outdoing me. You're always more humble than me. And this time I'm going to be more humble than you, okay? So go. Please, Josh. Okay. No, I, I need you, to win. I want to be more humble. I you be no, more. no, no, I'm more humble than you are. I'm greater than you are. No, you go ahead. I'd love to hear about your demons. And if there's time, then whatever. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. You are too polite, courteous. Okay, cool. Well, let's give the wheel a little spin there, shall we? Let's spin it. And uh, I appreciate that we're trying to outdo each other with humility. Now, that's what I'm talking about with Aslan's Rainbow, setting the whole stage for letting something larger than us emerge. Um, let me just set this up here. Got to delete some of these topics. Boom. How funny is that? So both of us went on. We were both humble and the wheel decided that, Joey, it's all you with telepathy. Uh, it's win, win, win. Please speak to us about telepathy, Joey. I love that topic. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Joshua. Um, I don't know if I've lost interest since I first mentioned about telepathy because I've, I've been going through different things and like uh, going into the self and we had all other discussions about the Holy Spirit and stuff. So there's other higher topics per se to go into but telepathy 
I, I just brought it up because it was something that landed in my lap and I didn't believe in telepathy. I, I did not believe or believe in it because I never had the experience. But once I had the experience and it was confirmed to me, it kind of confirms that God or some higher force or whatever that may be, if, if it's in Nirvana with the Buddha, there are no gods in, in any case, in, in that emptiness, that stillness and that self. And um, there are many powers and things that may come out of the self and telepathy is, I don't know if to call it a power and ability, just a connection. Um, I, I would be open to other hearing what other people have to say about that. I'm kind of more in a listening mode today than much of a speaking mode just uh catch in so anybody else would like to talk about that further I, i'd like to to learn as much as possible there it is there's that humble approach that you brought now joe you the man <laughs> no, uh, yeah i think the telepathy involves a receptivity so i think that's awesome i'll just quickly kick us off because um this was one of my first experiences in so-called psychosis is that I was telepathic and like I was so much so that my brother said you're reading my mind verbatim and I've spoken to many other people who go through these experiences of telepathy and they're just kind of uh, diagnosed as well sorry that doesn't fit with the now reductive materialism so you're crazy and yet in the bible Jesus was able to read people's minds he knew what they were thinking. So if 65% of America identifies as Christian, what do you mean? Of course, telepathy exists. There's also been some meta studies that show that the odds against chance of these kinds of things are one times 10 to the 104th power to one. In other words, it's definitely not chance. This kind of thing definitely exists. How the dynamics work, I mean, it's fascinating that you said um, it's harder to pick up on the minds of girls. That could be a whole topic in and of itself. Uh, but I think that if we could start to chart that in gatherings like this, um, I saw the non-local mind thing, and um, that's another thing that's been explored, but hasn't been properly honed in on. So I love the topic, Joey, and I think it actually ties into the gifts of the Holy Spirit, if we can be like Jesus. What are some other thoughts on it? Yeah, Ayana. I was thinking about this recently. I was watching a cartoon with my boyfriend, and at one point there was a couple And the, they say anything, but you know what it was? It was the energy. So you know what I discovered? We're all telepathic, but it's not as extreme as we think it is. It's just reading the energy <laughs> around us. Interesting. So then do we need to be in the vicinity of someone to be able, like, could I read your guys' minds? Or is it nonverbal communication? Yeah, yeah. That, that's another thing. Like, you can also, like, it could be just... You're seeing someone's face and you'd be like, okay, now you're, now you're like, now you can see it, but can, do you have to see someone's facial expression to catch their vibes? Not, not necessarily because um, I know empaths, especially you go into a room and they can see there's something in the air that doesn't feel right. You're not looking at any faces. Something doesn't feel right in the air. So I believe that that's our natural like ability to be telepathic as human beings. We all have it. Mm -hmm. It's just most of us don't have that ability to actually read someone's thoughts verbatim and from my experience with telepathy what i've kind of discerned from it because i think i have experienced it myself it's like i'll be receiving a message but it won't be verbatim what the person is thinking it'll be just like maybe my my like interpretation of what they're saying so mm. that's just my thoughts on it Yes, like in mutual dreams where two people dream the same terrain, they each add their own little spin to it based on their own context and they come back and have similarities, but your own context colors it. So I wonder if telepathy is more like entering to the dream domain. That's interesting. What about anybody else? You ever had experiences of telepathy? Yeah, Chelsea. I, what I'm really curious about is why Joey is getting these birthdays and like, what is that? You know, like, it seems like it's super important right now in your life. Like, you know, just this curiosity around like, like, what is this information? Like, why is that an important piece of information that you're getting right now? Yeah. What do you think, Joey? Well, that's a good question. And um, it, I started teaching uh, a couple of years ago at this school, a private school, and a lot of young kids going around and 
just one day they um, it came up about guessing someone's birthday and I got the first one right and I'm like oh this is strange and I did it again and again and it would happen at certain times then other times I um, wouldn't have it and I, I was one I was starting to investigate like why is it working more for boys than girls and why is it younger kids and not adults and you know I, I and I don't the, the numbers just appear and flash in my head when, and I don't necessarily look at their face. I actually try to not look at their face after they ask that and uh, just see what number comes in my head. And I just spurt it out, whatever number it is. And it's not like I tried to get it. It just appeared. And so I don't know why I'm, I'm gifted per se, or have that. It's not like I find it so useful per se to know someone's birthday. Cause we both, it's easy to find what someone's birthday is in the first place but it just confirms for me that there's something more and we can call it God or angels or something more. It just keeps on. It seems like God keeps on confirming to me. Yeah, I'm real. I'm real. I exist here. Is this enough? Do you want, you want more proof? So, wow. yeah. That's, That's absolutely changing. incredible. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And just the other day in one of my sessions, someone was saying that she, every single day she sees her birthday, the numbers of her birthday somewhere. And what she got out of it is that the universe is recognizing the uniqueness of her, her existence is kind of an affirmation. And I do wonder whether the younger generation is more open. Uh, there aren't these barriers yet. And as adults, maybe we've blocked some of that off. Am well, I on well, it? Uh, yeah. Sorry, go, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I was just going to say from the other side, um, when the students, when I tell them their birthday, they're shocked. And they're happy. And when I, when I get it wrong, you know, they're kind of sad that, oh, you didn't get mine, but you got the other person's. And I'm like, I don't know why. <laughs> but they're all like happy to see that this is possible and that there's something, there's something much more. So it's nice to, to be able to share that with people. It is. I think kids intuitively know that. That's why they love Disney and all these kind of magical powers. Yeah, that's awesome. Ayana, did you have something? No pressure. Yeah, yeah. So you can test your ability to to have tell if you can test it because what i do with my partner here is sometimes i'll tell him think of a color or think of a number and then and then i'll be like okay what's that and then he'll come to me and be like okay and i'll tell him and oftentimes i'm right sometimes i'm wrong so you can test it um that's a it's, it's fun like it, sometimes it's just he's like oh that's just coincidence but it, you can't test it. It can be kind of fun to do. Cause I know you were talking about doing like a card thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah. What a segue. Wow. <laughs> Why not? All right. Let's do this thing. Okay. I'll tell you what, let's get a little bit of evidence here as well. Put in the chat what you think it, the card is going to pick. I already know what it's going to be. So I'm telepathically sending you all the message of what the card is going to be. You put it in the chat. So it's backed up and then we just kind of have that as evidence. And no worries if you don't get it. This is just a game. The more we play with it, the more we get better. So get into that trusting space. Okay, I'll give us maybe seven more seconds to put it in there. Check it out, I even got a bell. <laughs> it's kind of cool. All right, so you got it and you've entered it into the chat. Well, our good old trusty wheel. Let's give our little wheel a spin, shall we? Let's see what we got. Oh, it's close. Hey. And it's the star, ladies and gentlemen, and it's the green star. Now we can go back and now we can look at the chat. Boom. So let's bring this up here. Let's see what we got. Star, Devin called it. Okay, now how many of us voted? We all said something different. That's true, Chelsea. So one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> and there were five, and there were five cards, and one of us got it right. Okay, so the odds are exactly chance. <laughs> but congrats to you, Devin. You're in tune, man, with the power of the Holy Spirit. What do, you, what do you guys think about that? We did put it to the test. Yeah, Chelsea. 
I think that with these things, um, it's like, I, I mean, I think there you can do some like maybe working on it and like practicing and stuff, but I just, I think it's like trying to make God like a magic trick or something mm. like that. There's, it's not just going to show up because we like want to want to prove it right now. I think that's the whole problem with like psy um, research and like my stepdad's a medical doctor and you know, he loves to, he, one time he like printed out these, this meta-analysis of sci research. And he was like, this is why it's all bullshit. And I was like, you know what though? Because, you know, there's, it can't be provable. I think that there's something that's really important about that and that it shows up when we need it and what's important. And, um, even like one year, my parents like got me like a ring or something and put it in one of these balloons. And like, they wanted me to like, you know, do some magic trick for them. And it was like, you know, it's just not how it works. I don't think like if you're doing these birthdays, it's because like, there's some reason that you, this is like a message that these kids need to hear right now. Whenever anything has shown up in my life, it's not just like random. It's like important. And anyway, that's what I think. It's awesome. It's like trying to measure a poem with a ruler. You're just using the wrong instrumentation to measure this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what about anybody else? I have a complaint. Oh no! What what is that? Don't no, that's have, a good thing. Don't have the wave one, Josh, because obviously you're you're gonna pick the wave one. And I didn't even pick. I just let it be randomized because I trust the flow, right, Ayana? We're learning that. No. I trust the flow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I was gonna pick the wave one. This guy. You're trying to read my mind based on your left brain. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's good. It, it, complaint valid. What about any other thoughts about telepathy or whether it exists? How do we hone in on this? What are we supposed to do with it? And Tom, thanks for posting. I didn't know you presented at that conference. Oh yeah, yes, please. Sorry, sorry the, the presentation is huge, but but there's one present, there are five different presenters. I think one of them talks about, um, and they're very worldly in the sense that they don't recognize, even Matt Mihalik doesn't recognize the psychic phenomena. Um, as such, there's one lady, I've forgotten what, but she deals with the fact that in, um, in our eyes, in the back of our eyes, we have an retina, we have a quantum processor that um, we can detect the Earth's magnetic field and so direct ourselves like some birds, migratory birds, like all creatures probably on the planet. Um, we are sensitive to the magnetic field of the Earth, which may be why we like the full moon, of course, because that, I, I think, interferes with the... So many of us are very sensitive to the magnetism and the changes around the full moon, we may get more energy. Um, so in her presentation, she just mentions that the eye um, has this little quantum processing thing which allows us to align with the Earth's magnetic field. So we'll, they talk about five senses. We all know that balance isn't there, that... that we have many more than five physical senses. When you look at someone from behind, sometimes you say that person looks attractive um, in some way. They may be in a black coat, but you just get a sense. Uh, you look at someone with very dark glasses on, and some of them look really scary. You can't see the feet. You can't. All you see is the mouth, and some of them look very attractive behind it. And you say, "What is that?" You, you're looking at them, but your eyes are taking in something other than, even if they're closed, other than the. The, the light rays, I think. Some people, I think 23% of populations maybe have this photic eye reflex where you look at the sun and you sneeze. Not everybody has that. So, so the eye has at least three things going on. Uh, one is the magnetism, two is the, the sneeze reflex, and three is light. So God knows our ears could have a whole lot. We can pick up all kinds of psychic phenomena, as we call them, perfectly naturally, I think. And, and as science begins to acknowledge them and look for them, it'll find them more and more and more, I believe. Um, your man Tish, the Canadian who, who at 17 months had his second eye removed, learned to echolocate, and they found in experiments that the vision centers, which were kind of redundant, uh, were recruited by the brain to process the echolocation to act as, you know, sonar centers in the brain. So the brain is incredibly plastic, of course. But I think so many things that we think of as, as supernatural are, are totally natural. And, um, and Joey, I think about the mistakes, I, I think I think resistance is thinking things go wrong. <laughs> this shouldn't be like this. And as soon as we say, wow, well, maybe it is, there's a wonderful cry, say yes and figure it out later. The masters at tennis or golf or anything, they don't have time to think, they just do the right move. And if it goes wrong, 
the hundredth time they make it, the ice skater, they'll get it right. Because say, don't, don't double second guess yourself. Don't even think at all. If you don't think twice, it's all right, Bob Dylan said. Don't even think when you step into mastery, when you've done your whatever it is for your 10,000 hours, as um, Gladwell will say, you instinctively, intuitively, it's, it's not that you know what to do. It's that you stop questioning that you know what to do. Like a child, you'd do it. Jesus said, unless you be like little children, shall not enter the kingdom. When you're worried, what, what you get, Karina, you know, when you cross a deadline, especially with a writer, especially a female writer, you get a clean house. Everybody knows that. Uh, I asked a lot of people, what is the meaning of life? And I got some really cool answers. Maybe the best was a guy who said, do the next best thing. And he didn't say it in a Christian, do the next best thing kind of way. He said, and I, I immediately roared laughing because I knew whatever way he meant it, God was giving the message, Tom, <laughs> you always do the next best thing anyway. You think you should be calm and quiet and loving on the Zoom. So what do you do? You lose your head and you get off and you forget your, you forget your talking stick. You know, you don't do the next best thing. <laughs> so so maybe, maybe God doesn't want you to do the best thing. Maybe God is so smart. Maybe God knows you better than you know yourself. Maybe God actually, actually wants you to do the next best thing. That's why he gives you the freaking hard thing to do until eventually you'll see through God and say, hey, God, I'm onto you. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to follow my joy anyway. And then you realize, oh, that's what Jesus said to do. Be like, just follow your joy. Say yes and figure it out later. I've got a deadline. I've got this incredibly important dissertation to have been by a certain date. <laughs> F that. Deadline. Dead. There's no, there's no such thing as death. And lines. You know, this person is moody. This person is bipolar. <laughs> All the lines are artificial. You know, This person is autistic. This person is on the spectrum. This person is ADD, HD. This person is poor concentration for their age. <laughs> All the lines are nonsense. But all our mistakes are God-given. And Joey, 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 when the child, uh, when you don't get the birthday, I would ask them again and laugh and again and again and again and say, hey, you need to think about your birthday a bit stronger. And when they do, you'd probably, poof, even if it's the 10th attempt, I just, that, that's still pretty good, you know? So, so, <laughs> I mean, when we see gladiator mr marcus aurelius ridley scott they all got it that that when we embrace our mistakes then the inner resistance is gone then we're in zen then we've stepped into our joy then we're little, like little children realized uh, i couldn't do wrong if i tried and the thinking that you can do wrong is just part of the oh my god god is way ahead of us every single time so when god wants something done he gives us something much harder to do and then we get the thing done and this, keep cleaning the house is the easiest thing in the world if you've got an incredibly difficult dissertation to write by next sunday we all know that i mean really it's like the christians you know when the guys when the guys do porn or whatever they do and they think god isn't watching you know god's watching from behind their eyes get over yourselves you know we're so stupid and we're meant to be what did niels bohr say um we have all been such idiots and that is exactly how it was meant to be it's such fun to look back and especially to, to cast off shame and like and say oh my god what shame was such a stupid thing you know <laughs> the shame was just meant made to make me think i could do wrong so that i'd do the things that god wanted me to do anyway so some guys are meant to stand sit there for four hours watching porn that's because god wanted them to do that you know and as soon as they realize that they probably stopped doing it <laughs> It's the incredible paradox of it all. So, Joey, I'd say when you don't get it the first time, ask them the second, the third, and the fourth, and the fifth time, and tell them they're not concentrating when you don't get it right. <laughs> That's it, right? Uh, they're talking. It's not. It's yeah. a. Thank it's you. A, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I I have I have done that a few yeah. times because yes. because I've done it like thirty times correctly. So out of those times, I did do it sometimes again and again, and I maybe I did it up to like four or five times, and often I would get their birthday by that time. So that does does work um but it was just it was just so much more impressive when it happened the first time that but it's so much funnier when you get it the fifth go isn't it i mean yeah yeah it's good that's good yeah i should i'm gonna work on that embrace I'll work on that embrace your embrace yeah, your. Thank so you. awesome. embrace <laughs> love it you guys love it yeah final comment by karina um, thank you, Tom. I loved it. It's, it I'm, I'm thinking about you know how you relate to to God. You know, if you've got children. My son went through a gothic phase, right? And he wanted black nail polish. So I said to him, okay, come, let's go and buy some black nail polish. And of course, then it was like, no, 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 I don't want black nail polish anymore. So it's the same kind of concept, right? We just God's children. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, very cool. That talking stick's got some power, man. And yeah, that ties into your topic of resistance too there, Karen. <laughs> yes. So Joey, thank you. That was fun. We could actually bring up a little test and get here. And you, we got some new perspectives on the birth date. I think you got a gift, man. And I would I would love to see what can come of it if you water that thing and nurture it and watch it flower. So thanks, bro. It's good to have you here. Let's spin this wheel. 
because we got 11 minutes left, which is about perfect timing to tap into either demons or Jesus. Ah, it's up to you. Which one are we going to tap into? There's no wrong choices, right? Oh, and demons win the day. <laughs> Tom, your, your humility. Wow. <laughs> Thanks for that humility. All right. Let me just very briefly uh, mention the whole topic of demons because um, what on earth are these things? Do they exist? I mean, they're in so many of our different cosmologies. When I went through my experience of being birthed into that higher dimension, I definitely was taken over by something else. Um, I've shared this before. I don't know whether it was my unconscious, whether it's a force from the outside. Um, so I think that there's something that transcends us in this world. And we know that we've been exploring that. So it's a double-edged sword, though. If you start to say that there's demons out there, and particularly things like neurodiversity have a demonic influence, then that's a really bad thing that labels all that. On the other side, this deep, rich heritage that we have in exploring these sentient forces, if we ignore all of that, we cut off that healing potential that could come from it. So I think as you know, society is changing, as the world's changing, maybe we're in a position where we can rethink what did they mean or what are some new nuanced ways that we can think about these, I don't know, sentient entities, these forces? Are they thoughts that take on a life of their own? Are they um, actual autonomous other beings from spiritual realms? Are they parts of ourselves that we've kind of silenced? Just wanted to throw that out there. Do you guys think that demons exist? And are there some different ways that we could think about it that could make it healing and helpful? Yeah, please, Ayana. I'm going to put on my witch's hat. <laughs> She's got the hat. Tom's got the stick. <laughs> got the bell. What? Got the props. I'm putting on my witch's hat. All right, because I I I know some of this stuff. <laughs> um, I have come to con conclude the conclusion about demons because yesterday I was I was at that convention that you're in, and they, this guy was talking about like the native perspective on psychosis, and he was saying one of the reasons the native people when they you know, they have someone that has schizophrenia or something. They said, oh, one of the reasons might be because of an evil spirit. I'm like, and I'm not sure. I don't, from my experience, I don't think demons are what we think they are. I think a lot of the times our demons are just within us. I really believe that. Mm -hmm. Either collectively, like it's a collective bad thing and the collective unconscious, that's a negative that comes through us or it's just our inner shadow that's how that's what i've come to terms with because when i had my experience with the demon i would i would always ask it why do you always sound human why do you always sound human aren't demons supposed to be angels aren't demons supposed to be transcendent because they the way that the demon re interact with me would be like if i was interacting with another person or even myself so i'm like that doesn't make sense to me. I know angels are much more intelligent and much more powerful than this. Like they don't have these weaknesses. And so I came to the conclusion that it's a, it's ourselves. It's our humanity. That's the real demon. That's how I see it at least. And another thing is, and I, I'm not sure about this, but um, it is possible that telepathy has something to do with this as well. Like if you're getting messages from something, it could be a another human being not necessarily a dark force it could be just spiritual warfare that's happening between you and someone else because some people are very gifted at telepathy and these these higher what we call supernatural abilities there's people that use them for bad and use them for good so i i was kind of thinking about what tom said about how this fire and this wind is like all around us it's like i kind of see it as like the force the dark side or the light side we all have both but what side do you choose and if you have those special abilities and you have the ability to be telepathic to 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 have that kind of spiritual like power um are you going to use that for evil so that's my mm. thought on it <laughs> oh good stuff i love that thank you that Fascinating. Yeah, that even helped me fill in a couple of the gaps in my thinking. Thanks for that. What about anybody else? Demons. Yeah, Chelsea. So, um, yeah, that was helpful for me, too, because it got me thinking about um, the elementals, which is basically like just energy. Well, it, it's like these... Um, subtle energy bodies that are kind of just like a collection of energies that they feed off of our our consciousness and they have 
kind of like this will to feed off of our consciousness. So they, you know, try to like kind of whisper to, to do negative things. And then we're, as we fight them or as we engage with them, that's how they kind of get energy from us. So I think that the, those things are kind of true. Like, and Eckhart Tolle kind of talks about them and there's some interesting, um, work. I, we talked a little bit last time or maybe the time before, um, Powell has some work on that and Blazansky. Um, uh, these are like kind of, um, mediums and or clairvoyants that <clears throat> have written some kind of books on how basically these like our thoughts can kind of like create these kind of energy these kind of subtle structures um or energies and then they feed like negative energy feeds off of negative energy right so i think that what you're saying is like so true because it's like it does have a lot to do with how what we're thinking about and like what we're devoting our energy to and that's going to feed whatever direction, you know, we're going. So if we're like thinking about and feeding a lot of like negative and hate and, and that sort of thing that those elementals might be more attracted and kind of grow off of us. Um, yeah, exactly what you were saying about the wolf thing for sure. So, um, but then I also started thinking about like Lucifer and like kind of that idea of like, you know, being against free will and that, you know, that we needed to be controlled. So it's like almost like there's two different things, maybe like some type of like higher being that might have a consciousness that wants to control us. And then these elementals that really are only, uh, you know, they only have energy if we give it to them. Mm, oh, I love that. that. That's so interesting. I think it's such rich ground for discussion and still so mysterious. I, I believe in the, that elementals sort of thing and that they're feeding on this negative energy. So thanks, Chelsea. I also think it's really cool that Tom's topic of Jesus closes us off today. We, we got to chat a little bit about demons here, but let's pass on the buck because we want to end at 111 or close-ish to it to talk about Jesus and are we all the next manifestation of Jesus? Please take it away, Tom. Yeah, thanks. Well, the thing, I, I, I don't know why I just happened to mention porn. Please don't, 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 don't. Please don't leap to conclusions. But um, I think Jesus confronted the Pharisees and there's a very famous passage where he says, in the Gospel of Thomas, he says, um, you are like uh, dogs in a manger. You will not go to the kingdom and you block others from going there. He, he, elsewhere, apparently in the canonical Gospels, he says they're white and sepulchres, they're hypocrites. Um, when I met with a group of Jesus freaks in the town, the self-styled Jesus freaks, I, I, I thought I was above them, of course, but they, they kept on backsliding and the big backslide was they'd go home and they'd watch porn, you know, and they'd oh my God, you know, I've, I've, and they were obsessed with it. And it was because obviously they felt it was so evil. Um, and that keeps them, I think, on the hind foot. And not only could they be doing more constructive things than, than doing that, but when they're beating themselves up for it, when you, fearing fear is more fear, is more resistance. We're all smart enough now to know that when the brightest among us, whether it was Eisenhower or Churchill, all of them said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. He was being an idiot because that's just more fear. If we, if we, it's, it's just passing it on. It's more resistance. Totally wisely says, um, try and accept the present moment when you find you can't. Try and accept your non-acceptance. When you find you can't, you know, just, but eventually, you say, oh, what the heck is this, this is too much resistance. You know, <laughs> it just gets funny eventually. So you stop resisting. So I think it's crucial for Christian guys, anyone who might be listening to this, that Jesus is quoted as saying, you say that when you commit adultery, it's adultery. But I say that when you look at a woman lustfully, you've already done your heart. I say to Christian guys, did you ever look lustfully or even with sexual desire or even in a kind of sexual connotation with your wife before you married her? So, well, yes. Well, was that not fornication then? No. Would you not have been doing the woman a disservice to marry her without feeling kind of some sexual attraction in the first place? And I said, yeah. I mean, for goodness sake. And then when you marry her, are you meant to st block, immediately have not see what sexual attraction is in some other? It's so ludicrous. And yet the Pharisees and pastors for thousands of years have made guys feel, I'm flawed and I'm sinful because I'm, you know. I mean, it's so ludicrous like so many other. It's like saying eternity begins when we die. It's nuts, and we're smart enough now, thanks to the internet and, and all the stupidity, to finally say, oh my goodness, you're, it's the, the emperor has no clothes, you know. Um, when that one falls off, the, the power of pastors to say, I forgive you the sin of lust of thinking about this woman you're not married to, th that's gone, and then the power is gone. And then when the leaders have no power and no money, 
eventually we say, oh my goodness, the kingdom is within us, it always was. And the Gospel of Thomas, where he says in the third saying, if your leaders say the kingdom is elsewhere, the heck with them. It's within you always. Uh, we know that. Josh, you know it. And you show, Josh, you have, um, without trying to out-humble you, Josh, I don't know how, I, I've, I've watched you all these sessions. You give and you give it. I mean it with all my heart, you know I do. That, that I've never seen an evil look on you. I see you're, you're managing all this technology and somehow, it's not you, Josh, something is using you, obviously. And just this light comes through you all the time and we all get it. And you know the greatest, greatest, greatest miracle in the world, Josh? The greatest miracle is that there aren't 20,000 people on this friggin' Zoom right now. How come there's only enough to manage? That's a huge miracle. Thank you, God, for all of you. I mean, it's so obvious we're all the second coming of Christ. Whether you want to call it an avatar or a Krishna or whatever, it's we're all becoming enlightened beings very fast. And he's coming back, or Jesus, or whatever it is, it's coming through as it always was. And um and 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 that and that's it, I guess. Thank you. You thank you. And uh, sorry, Gandhi, Gandhi, Gandhi said, um, all the little demons are running around on our own in our own hearts, and that's where we must confront them every day. He didn't say fight them, just look at them, like the little guy in how to train your dragon. You look your demon in the eye and say, you're not so scary after all. Jesus apparently is an amazing miracle that in the, some gospel he says, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you. Not I forgive yours. Your sins are given you in advance, forgiven you. Forgiven you, or take up your pattern more. They get, your mistakes are written into you. Your flaws are your most divine, beautiful part. Your stupidity is divine. It's your best bit. And you probably do your best work in your sleep. Yeah. I've convinced say, me. Thank you. I have convinced me. Thank you. Say more about the me part and, you know, that something working through me and how great I am. Come on. That was, <laughs> <laughs> ah, you, you're the man, Tom. Thanks for that. Man. that, that what a way to end. Thanks, bro. Well, let's take a couple of comments on that. What, what are we thinking? And we'll call it a beautiful day. I liked it. I vote yes. We got the thumbs up all around. We got shakas and everything. I vote. I vote yes. Uh, Tom. Tom is just also what he. He's amazing. I don't know where he gets. He inspires all this. Th these amazing words. I, I. I can't believe he even exists. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> I can't either. Bro, you're on fire today, man. You are in, on form today. Well said. Any more concluding comments on this topic of of Jesus and are we all the next Jesus or anything that Tom said? I'm so sorry, Josh. Sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, Chelsea had a thumb up. That might be a comment. No, that was just an endorsement. Yes, please, Tom. Round sorry, us up. I, I, if I said Jesus, that was a divine mistake. I meant to say, Jesus was the guy. Thomas is the guy. Christ is the light. The, the uh, whether I don't know the difference between the light and the Holy Spirit, but the second coming of Christ, the 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 light, the the channeling, the presence, whatever, our highest self, our sense of humor. Do we ever have, look at Desmond Tutu. He may be a Christian archbishop in South Africa, but that man, like Josh, pure light, pure Ubuntu. When his face would, when for one moment he'd look serious, I'd say, he's lost it. And then I'd say, oh my God, that's me for 99.99999% of the day. And when 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 Tutu would lose, you'd say, <laughs> he's lost it. If Tutu wasn't the second coming of Christ, none of us is, obviously. <laughs> Holy cow, what a guy. May he rest and joy. That's awesome, man. Yeah, apparently, like, he walked into the room with, like, a serious meeting with the Pope, and they just started doing a dance. I was like, yes, bro, that's what I'm talking about. That's exactly what you're saying. Well, Tom, thanks. I think we do all bear the light, and, you know, Christ meant the anointed one. So that's absolutely right. I think we are anointed, and as the light emerges next time, it will be December 10th will be the Saturday closest to the full moon, where the light assembles to provide illumination that's more than the sum of our parts i will be in south africa so i'm hoping that the internet's all good and the electricity is there but if you can please pull in for the december 10th gathering I, i'm super looking forward to it i just love this community that we've got i so appreciate all the diversity that we bring thanks for making the time to spend time with us on a saturday each one of you is a legend and go out and be the light of illumination for this next month and i will catch you in exactly one cycle's time Peace out, everybody. Cute. Aslan's Aslan rainbow. rainbow. Inspiration for transformation. Transformation.
oh, yes, the lion lives within all of us. And sometimes it lets out a humble meow.